So now we've basically talked about general concepts of physics one and physics two, and next we're going to talk about the concepts associated with physics three. Now I think I briefly told you one of my favorite parts of physics is actually the electricity and magnetism part. I don't know why, just for some reason always you know, fascinated me. So everybody here has some idea of magnets, right? Whoops, magnets. So we call it, uh, what surrounds a magnet, we call it a magnetic field. Right? Which you can actually do an experiment at home and try to check it out yourself. But if you have a bar magnet here, right, North Pole, South Pole, remember all that stuff when you were a kid, it turns out that we, in physics, talk about this invisible field that surrounds it. We can't see it, we can't really touch it, but we know it's there because it, it can make, it can influence the environment. So this uh, has mag what we call a magnetic field lines, which are kind of invisible lines of kind of a force, you can think of it that way that surround this guy. And then we have, in, uh, uh, analogously to this, a magnetic field, I told you, an electric field are kind of like peanut butter and jelly. So if this is the peanut butter, the jelly is called the electric field. So if we have, for instance, a proton with a positive charge there, there's an invisible field that we say surrounds this uh, guy, but it doesn't form these closed loops like this. It forms kind of these radial kind of arrows that kind of emanate from the, uh, the charged particle. So it, it works for uh, protons, and it also works for any charged particle. So there's an electric field that surrounds an electron also, but it goes the other direction. And so what we basically say is, you can see there's some similarities here, but there's obvious differences. I mean, these guys form loops, these guys don't form loops, and the, the other main difference is it's sort of like how they were discovered to begin with. If I were to take a, another proton like, and stick it inside this electric field right here, like this is a test particle, what's going to happen? It turns out that this electric field is going to push on this charged particle, and it's going to push with a force F, and it's going to push it directly away from this guy. Remember, like charges repel and opposites attract. So we, what we say in physics is that instead of just saying like charges repel, what we say is that this charge generates an electric field, and that electric field is what pushes on the proton with a force F. And we're going to learn how to calculate that. And then if you go in here with the magnetic field, Interestingly, uh, and, and, and fascinating from my point of view, if I were to take the same proton and put it inside of this magnetic field, and if I just have a stationary uh, particle here inside the magnetic field, nothing at all is going to happen. The magnetic field will not push on that particle, right? But if I have this particle, if I start to move this particle myself, right, in, in some kind of uh, uh, direction, whether it's this way or whether it's, whether it's this way or whatever, if I start moving it in motion uh, inside of this magnetic field, then a force will pop up and push that particle. The magnetic force will push that particle, but it will not push it along the direction of motion like this one. It'll push it sideways. So it's really bizarre. Not only are the fields, they look different, but they actually push on charged particles differently the proton is pushed away in the same direction of the field lines, and the other guy, only when it's moving, is pushed kind of tangential to the magnetic field, right? But only when it's moving. When it's stationary, nothing happens at all. So we know they're similar, electricity and magnetism, but they're not quite the same. I should revise that and say that modern physics has combined electricity and magnetism, which seem to be very different things, into a single thing called electromagnetism. You may have heard of that, electromagnetic waves, electromagnetism. It turns out that if you take an electric field and a magnetic field and you oscillate them, then in an oscillating fashion like we talked about the water waves, then what will happen is an electromagnetic wave will form. It'll be oscillating in the electric field and it'll also be oscillating in the magnetic field and it will propagate just like that water wave throughout space, but it'll even go through a vacuum throughout deep space with nothing there. It'll just travel by itself and it carries energy. That's how you get a sunburn. It hits your skin and it carries energy from the sun. So. Why do we care about electromagnetic waves? Well, because you're bathed in it every single day. The light you see now is visible light. Also, we have x-rays, gamma rays, infrared light, 
Uh, I could go on and on. Basically, all of those are electromagnetic waves. It's just that they're oscillating at different speeds or frequencies, we call it. So visible light is a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of electromagnetism that you can actually see with your eyes. All the other stuff is exactly the same, but oscillating in a region of, of, of frequency that you can't see because your eyes just aren't sensitive to it. But it's the same physics involved. Okay. So now we've covered physics one, physics two, physics three overview, and next we're going to talk briefly about one of my favorite things, relativity and quantum mechanics. Now truthfully, you're living in an amazing time because you can, you can open up a book or watch a lesson or get a lecture from, from knowledge of, that was handed down before you about some of the craziest, wackiest stuff that we've discovered to be absolutely true about our universe, and that's relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity, and quantum mechanics, which was developed by many people. Both of these theories were done in the early part of the 20th century, so about 100 years old. Uh, and to be honest with you, we still don't quite understand these theories totally. I mean, we understand a lot about relativity. We don't understand quantum mechanics that well, even today. And well, there's tons of problems, real problems, that we can't solve in either theory just because the math is too hard. But we understand how we would do it, we just, the math gets so difficult sometimes. But the basic idea about relativity I talked to you about before is that time and space, see I didn't mention the space before, time and space are relative to your state of motion. If I move really fast near the speed of light, time and space will behave differently for me than it does for you if you're not moving. And that seems weird because if I take two clocks and they're synchronized, tick, tick, and they're, they're both the same, you think that time would exist the same for both of us. That's our everyday experience. But in fact, if you actually go fly that second clock in a spaceship and get really close to the speed of light, which we can't do, but if you could do it, then when it came back, you would find that that clock has a different time elapsed than the clock on home. Uh, at home. How close? Well, we have to do some problems to illustrate that, but when I say how close, I'm talking like 0.99999 times the speed of light, which is incredibly fast because the speed of light can go seven times around the planet Earth in one second. So think about, that's one second, that's another second, that's another second. Every one of those seconds, light goes around the planet seven times. It's incredibly, unfathomably fast. So to be honest with you, wrapping your brain about the idea, around the idea, that time can be different for two people depending on their state of motion, how fast they're going, is very, very hard to accept because we don't, we don't see it every day. And the reason we don't see it is because we don't travel very fast. We're traveling at a snail's pace. But we've proven that these things are true by looking at accelerating electrons and other particles in particle accelerators because we can get electrons going very close to the speed of light. We can get other particles uh, that, that exist. They're going very near the speed of light. And we can, it's a long story with the way the experiments are done, but we can definitely show that time travels differently for different people. We've actually taken uh, atomic clocks, very accurate clocks, and flown them on airplanes. Very, that's not near the speed of light, but it's, it's as fast as we can go. And we get those clocks and we compare them when we come back uh, down to Earth and we see that the clocks don't agree anymore because time actually, it wasn't because the clock is broken, it's because time actually ticks differently depending on how fast you're moving. Now the second part of kind of modern physics, there's a lot to it, but we call it quantum mechanics. And I know that you've heard that term, but it's a nebulous, scary sounding thing. And to be truthful, as I said before, nobody really understands why quantum mechanics works the way it does, but what we do know is that it absolutely does describe our reality. So one thing we know Remember I told you light was an electromagnetic wave. Well, it turns out that light, when you actually do detailed experiments on it, it behaves as a wave in some experiments, like we talked about oscillating electro uh, electromagnetic uh, fields. And it also behaves as a particle. The particle is called a photon. So I know you've heard the term photon, photon of light. Well, in some experiments, light can, um, light can behave like a wave. And I, we'll get into the details later. But in other experiments, it behaves very much like a, like a particle, like, a, like I don't want to call it a solid object, but a discrete object called a photon. So is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, the truth is it's both. It's, it's something else that we don't have a word for, but it's called a wave and a particle. Now, here's the other part that will blow your mind. Matter, meaning electrons protons, pretty much anything, can behave, obviously, as a particle. 
because we've done lots of experiments with electrons, we know they're little particle things, but it can also have characteristics of a wave. That should blow your mind because it's absolutely crazy that I can take an electron and it can behave in some experiments like a, like a little discrete particle, but in other experiments it can interfere like waves interfere. So are electrons particles or waves? Is photons particles or waves? Well, it turns out that when you really zoom into the microscopic level of our reality, a different set of rules apply. Actually, all the same rules are applying all the time, but they just manifest differently at these large, large scales that we live in. But when you zoom in, you can see the, the rules for what they really are, and photons and electrons and protons, they all behave what we call quantum mechanically. They, they have characteristics of a particle and also characteristics of a wave. What are they? Who knows? We can't really see them. We can't touch them. We can't poke them with a pair of tweezers, but we can do experiments, and we know that they behave with these different characteristics. What we also figured out with quantum mechanics is that if you have a proton in a nucleus of an atom, right, that the electrons, you probably already learned in kind of chemistry class, that you might have, you might have like an electron like right there. And we say it's going around the nucleus. Well, it turns out it doesn't really behave like a solar system going around and around and around. We'll get into the details later. But these electrons, they can only exist in what we call certain energy levels. So this might be energy level number one, and this might be energy level number two. The electron can never, ever, ever, ever exist in between these energy levels, which is weird because the moon or satellites in space, they're going around the Earth. We can put a satellite anywhere we want in the Earth's gravity field, but you cannot put an electron here in between the energy levels. It has to be in discrete energy levels. But what you can do is I can put some electricity into this and I can pump this electron up into the higher uh, state. So I can excite it. I can excite it maybe with electricity. So what happens when I do that? Well, then I'm going to have the proton in the same place. I'm going to have energy level number one. I'm going to have energy level number two. And the electron, when I excite it with electricity, is going to move from this guy. It's going to pop up temporarily up to the higher energy state. But it's not going to stay there forever. As soon as I stop exciting it, it's going to decay right back down to the lower energy state that it likes to live in. So I'm going to put a little arrow here and I'm going to say it's going to decay. Now what happens when it decays? That's the interesting part. What's going to happen is you have a proton, you have energy no level number one, energy level number two. It drops back down in here, and when it drops back down, it actually releases a photon it actually releases a photon. So matter can be, electrons can be excited to a higher energy level and then they can decay back. But when they decay back, they release a photon. That is what is happening when you take a piece of iron and you heat it in a campfire and you pull it out of the campfire and it's red. Why is it red? Have you ever thought about that? Why is it glowing? It's because all the electrons have been pumped up from the fire, from the energy, and there are a lot of them are existing in this higher state, but when I pull it out, they start decaying down. There's billions and billions and billions of them, they start decaying down, and when they do, they start releasing photons, which are light, light particles, which we already told you could be a wave or a particle, right? Why do we care about this? Because we can t use matter to make photons. That is how all computer screens are made, like actually screens on your phone. We use these quantum mechanical effects to make those screens. We use these effects of, of the way energy levels work to make things called transistors, which make computer chips. So literally, without quantum mechanics, there would be no computer chips, and there definitely wouldn't be any computer screens, like iPhones or, or Androids or whatever. None of that stuff would exist. So to wrap up everything that we said, starting with the very basics of physics one and learning force, motion, energy, thermodynamics, waves, electricity, magnetism, on into quantum mechanics and relativity. Humanity has started from basically just learning how to make shelter and fire to being able to go into space, to build computers, to calculate things, to make communication devices, to make medical imaging, you know, x-ray machines, things like that, all by understanding this thing that we call physics. So journey with me as we go into the forest, and when we come out the other side of the forest, you will know and understand these concepts. You'll be able to solve problems, obviously to do well in class, but also just so that you understand how the world works. And then some of you will go on and make further discoveries and figure out why is this the way it is? Why is relativity the way it is? And come up with the next big theories, which will take humanity on into the next step.